Come on next week.
I think that's about it. I want to pray with you real quick. And uh, actually, no, not real quick. I'm going to pray with you. And, uh, and then we're going to jump into our Bible. So I'm going to we'll study some stuff. Is that cool? All right. Pray with you. I feel you. I love you guys. Um, Father, thank you for letting us gather here tonight. Thank you for the beautiful music you've blessed us with. Beautiful place. Come and hang out. It's a family. So we thank you, Lord, for reaching down from heaven into our lives, saving us, and bringing us here today. You brought us here today by no accident. There's obviously a reason why we're here, each and every one of us. And you just want to talk to us. This is, what, this is how you do it. There are many ways that you do it, Lord, but this is not this one way. You just gather people in a room, and you talk to them. And you sing over them. You heal them. Smile down. Gives us joy. Thank you for that. I give you props, God, for bringing Corey back to us. Thank you. I appreciate his friendship and his smile. Always in a good mood. You can learn from him. Lord, I pray that you'll uh, just be with me and help me deliver what I believe you've given me in my heart to, to deliver to you, precious people, here tonight. So you accomplish your goal. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us something that's beautiful and perfect that we can live under the authority of. And know that if we just live by it, I'll thank you work out great. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, the last couple of weeks have been kind of weird. Um, I don't know what you guys have been up to. I don't know what you do day to day to day to day to day. You guys probably know what I'm doing day to day to day to day to day. But the last few weeks have been really strange. It's been pretty well overwhelming. Uh, the workload has been transitioning from SNL to uh, Revolution Church, and it's not just a sign. You know, there's signs and there's business cards um, and there's bumper stickers and T-shirts and things of that nature. Um, you'll notice some of the signs on the walls have to be changed. The sign of the building has to be changed. You got to work with the bank. You know, they want to know who you are. The government doesn't let you do anything without them knowing. And so you have to file for a fictitious name and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of work involved. You got to contact all the companies that you're already working with, like right down to like the little dumpster. I got to tell the lady who's delivering the mail so she doesn't go, hey, what's this? You know, and throw the, the bill out the window or something. Uh, so we have to, there's a lot of things that you got to do. One of the things you have to do that's been really time consuming is all the media avenues. You know, I, I, I don't think that they're the most important thing. I think this is the most important thing. Uh, but if a church is to be effective, I think it's going to be beyond these walls. You know what I mean? And we can go personally and talk to people. But one of the things that we can do that, that we've been blessed with is this great media outlets. Technology is good if it's used the right way. And so we've got, you know, our apps and our Facebook page and our YouTube channel and all that kind of stuff. And we can reach out uh, to other people uh, beyond the, these walls and really all of those media outlets are really to, to, to accomplish one thing just like this relational community you know and people just kind of connect there's a lot of connectivity it's a small small world you can talk to people in the Philippines and in Africa and Australia like right now on your phone right here you know what I mean you can just go in and call someone in Hawaii right now like it's it's a small small world and so uh, we're building these communities and that's that's one of the things that gets thrown around in the church a lot, this idea of community. You know, there's these, these words in church, sanctify and holy and saved and, and all this stuff. Like, we don't even know what they are until someone stops and, like, busts out the dictionary and the Google and the Bible and start, starts to explain these things to you. And one of the things I know that's been thrown around my whole Christian life all the time is community. You hear it all the time that God's building a community. And so uh, this week, as I was thinking about uh, 
the, the revolution, how we're going to look at the landscape and, and, and have a change in the status quo, I start thinking about community. I start thinking about our church. And, I, and that was what, that's what I want to talk about tonight with you is this whole idea of community. I started, as I was changing all of the Facebook and the, and the apps over to Revolution, I started thinking about this whole idea of community. And so if we're to change the world that we live in, change the situation that we're in, we need to really get a, 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 our brains around this idea of community because really it's more than, to, the church is more than just showing up here tonight. And just coming in and, and checking the box and saying, I went to church. A lot of people do that. They go to church because they, their parents tell them they have to go to church. Or they've always gone to church and they feel guilty if they didn't go to church. But they're really not part of a community. You see what I'm saying? And, and I want you to understand something too. We, this church has never had members. But but mark my words, we got members, don't we? We have members. Like we're a, we're a family here. This is a family. You don't need class 101 and 102 and 103 to prove that you're part of something. You know how you prove you, you're participating in it. You know when you call someone here, they're there to help you. I don't need a membership class to love my friend. Do you know what I'm saying? And so we have members here, but I wanted to kind of dive into this idea of, of community. I want to throw a, a definition up on the table just so you can have an idea of, of what community is. Uh, this is what community is. It's defined this way. It's a feeling of fellowship with others. Now, fellowship is, of course, we've said this before, it's not going down into the fellowship hall and having punch and, and, and cookies after church. That's, that's, that's not fellowship, although that's what people think that it is, okay? Fellowship is like when we have something in common and we're arm in arm pursuing the same goal together. Okay? So it's a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. Also, it's the sharing of a common characteristic. Okay, And that's what community is. Now, community can form around a variety of different things. And I never really thought about it, but you stop and you're studying something that starts to dawn on you what community forms around. We can form communities around all kinds of things, like different types of hobbies. Uh, we can form communities around horses and different specific dog breeds. And we can form communities around sports teams, like the Gator Nation, right? There ain't Gators in here, right? There's the Gator Nation, isn't there? Right? There's the Red Sox Nation, right? Now listen, this is really weird, right? I'm from Boston, where people are Red Sox fans. It's, I know you hate them, but logical, right? Okay. Now, I moved down here to Florida, and nobody is a Red Sox fan. Of course, right? Because everyone down here hates not the New York Yankees, which they should. They hate Yankees from the north, right? So all, so all of a sudden, the Red Sox win the World Series, and everyone's a Red Sox fan. But you see Red Sox hats and shirts everywhere. All the time. It's amazing. Like, we just had the Super Bowl, right? Like, I haven't even heard of the Seattle Seahawks. Are they even a team? Like, we couldn't be further away from them. We're down here in Florida, and they're way up here, like, in Russia somewhere. Right? But everyone, everyone's like, yeah, man, the birds and the boys, man. I, I, we go way back. Really? Name one player. Everyone's a seat. They change this bandwagon thing. It happens all the time, right? Um, people move though. See, they move, and so like you, you're a die-hard Celtic fan. You're from Boston. You grew up there. Your blood's green. And then you move to Orlando, and now all of a sudden you're a Magic fan. <laughs> what? <laughs> but, but it happens all the time. You you move and you jump on a bandwagon. You, you change. Uh, your loyalty to the city that you're living in. Um, kids go to college, you're a Gator, right? But then your grandkids go to Auburn, and all of a sudden, what happens? Auburn fan! Woo! It happens all the time. The bandwagon, it kills all these little interests, okay? It kills all these interests. People are trying to get into community. And, and there's all types of communities around, like, 
I live in the Groves. It's a community, if you will, right? Let me just say something about housing developments. I live in one. There's only one thing that makes us a community. Our address. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I don't know anyone who lives there. I was guilty of that, right? Like, I know some. But let's face it. Do we know? Are we, like, going up, bringing pies to our neighbors, right? We're not doing that. So the only thing that makes us a community is that we live behind a sign that says, The Groves. And the other thing that makes us a community is that every house is the same. Okay, so we're all the same. Little clones, little Grove clones, and they live in one little place. That's the only thing that brings us together. So the community is a fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals, and sharing common characteristics. Now, uh, you start doing a little research when you're doing these apps and the Facebook and all this kind of stuff, and you start realizing how people are so desperate to make community, to, to join together, to be identified with something, right? So I did a little research and I found out uh, about some of these online communities. Okay? I don't know how you bring a pie to a guy in Kansas, but I'm sure there's an app for it. Right? Um, does anyone Snapchat here? Do you know how many people Snapchat? It's crazy. 26 million people Snapchat. Just to give you some perspective, that's the population of Texas. That's how many people Snapchat, okay? I'm gonna build it up. Do um, you know what WordPress is? WordPress is the company that the, they make blogs. So, so if you want your own little platform so you could yell at the world, Okay, you, you go to WordPress, you start a blog. 75 million WordPress blogs. Okay? 75 million. That's three times the size of Texas. Okay? Um, anyone tweet here? Anyone tweet? Anyone tweet? Not a big tweeter here, right? Okay? Twi Twitter? Twitter has 243 million people tweeting. They tweet. I try tweeting. I don't like tweeting. But there's a daddy to all this. Y'all know who it is, right? Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> Facebook. Facebook has 1.23 billion pages, right? People, music groups, organizations, churches. You name it. You know who my favorite guy is? My favorite page on all of Facebook, I found this week when I was researching it. It's Doug the Danger Clown. <laughs> Doug the Danger Clown, he lives in Toronto, and he dresses up like a clown, and he shows up at various concerts and shows, and here's why. Because he can. I love Doug the Danger. I think we should all go to his page and like it. What do you think? Nope. Come on now. It's Doug the Danger Clown. I love Doug the Danger Clown. I thought he was really, really cool. But here's the thing. These are all good, right? But it's different. Like, I didn't live in this world. I'm just like trying to, I'm trying to be young, and I'm trying to get in here a little bit, utilize these tools. But you know, like, it was a different world when I was a kid. I don't want to age myself, but you know we had six channels on my TV? Yeah. We had ABC. NBC, CBS, Fox hadn't started yet, so I'm really aged. We had two, I know you guys have never heard of this, but UHF channels, right? And public television, because you know, getting your props to Sesame Street. Everyone watched that, right? That's what we had. There was no remote. <laughs> right? <laughs> There's no remote at my house, and a cell phone. That was a James Bond fantasy, right? We talked about, man, someday. Yeah. That we're going to have a phone that didn't have that wretched cord from hell that we had to deal with when we were at our house. That's the world that we lived in, but it's way different now. People are trying to connect all the time, and we use the internet to do it most often. But Christian community is way, way different. Christian community is way different in that... It, it, 
Here's one of the reasons why it's way different. The Gators, and I'm not ripping the Gators, or the Red Sox or anyone, okay, they play for their own benefit. It's for them. And you like it. So you connect to it. The Christian community is way different. It's Jesus Christ did something for you. And because he did it, you're actually on that team. See, when the Gators win, I get no, I get no praise. When the Seahawks win, I get no praise. When the Broncos win, the Patriots win, the Red Sox win, the Bills win, whatever make a difference. You don't get it. You, you know what I'm saying? Like Mark's been a fan of his whole life, but he's never got a dollar when they won. Do you know what I'm saying? He's never reaped the benefit of that victory. But the Christian community is centered on something way different. It's centered on Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's way, way different. And it's way different in that it's all-inclusive. Like, the, here's the fact is that every single human being on earth is broken, and we're all falling short of the glory of God. It, there's a rebellion at first, and we're continuing to rebel against Him. But God, because He loves, He comes down in the person of Jesus, lives a perfect life, knows His rule is that you have to believe something's got to die and bleed for, for, for forgiveness to take place. And so he goes to the cross himself and he bleeds and dies for you. And he resurrects to put you in the family. And so that is a, that's the difference between all these other little, these little communities that are all nice and happy, okay? Like when the Red Sox win, and then there's the community, which is the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the temple of the Lord, the church, and that's that's who we are. And so what I want to do is I want to take a few minutes, I want to, I want to show you how did Jesus do this? How did he bring us together into this community that I see? See, where I'm standing, I see everybody, I see a lot of different folks, right? I see a lot of different folks. How did this all happen? Did you just stumble upon this place? So I think it's got to work. Let me share some of you. Go to um, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 through 16. You're going to see Jesus begin to work here and create something that you're now reaping the benefit of right now as you sit here. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. If you don't have a Bible... I want to invite you to pick up one of these Bibles on the chairs, a yellow or an orange, and there should be a page number up on the screen on a um, on the majority of the verses we will share moving forward. Okay, here we are. Verse fourteen: For Christ Himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one. People when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this. That's major. It's, to notice this, it's he did this. He did this. Okay, it's nothing that we have done. He did this by ending the system of law that, with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility toward each other has been put to death. One more verse, Colossians 3.11. Just a few pages from where we were. Colossians 3.11 gets a little bit more detail. It's not just Jew and Gentile, which is God's people that believe in him and then those that don't. But he, he, he gets a little bit more in detail here. Just in case you can't identify with one of the two groups that's already been mentioned, he says that in this new life, verse 11, in this new life, like as Christians, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. We know that. Then he says, circumcised or uncircumcised. So are you the religious type, being the churchgoer or not? Not quite sure. Have you followed all the law? Have you not followed all the law? Who's followed all the law? See, nobody can. He says, it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. Then he gets a little crazy. He says, barbaric. Like, I don't know any barbarians in here. Uncivilized. I know some of them. Uh, he said, slave or free. Christ is all that matters. He lives in us. Like, 
He's like, it doesn't make any difference who you are. Do you see the diversity, all the people groups that he's talking about, that because of what he did on the cross, he's drawing in all these different people from all different walks of life, all ages and colors and beliefs and traditions. It doesn't make any difference if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter. He brings you all into this community, which is the church. And so we see also in John 10, 16, he goes on, he says, now I bring them all together, and there's going to be one flock. One flock with one shepherd. So none of this division. None, none, it's us against them. It's not Baptist against Methodist. It's not that. There's one flock with one shepherd. And, and, and this is not thus saith the Lord, but in my heart of hearts, I'm deeply convinced that he never intended to have denominations. He just had people that did believe and love and then didn't. His desire is that there really wouldn't be any that didn't, but he knows, we all know, that there will be some that will say no. But he never said that we were to divide you up into more. He said that there will be one flock with one shepherd. So the idea here is that Jesus Christ is the one who started the community and he runs and oversees the community universally he is the pastor of his church you guys you know what I'm saying so universally he's the pastor but he's also the pastor of each little franchise if you will so here's the picture it's it's that Jesus is the, the president and CEO of McDonald's but he's also the store manager of every store location so he decides how it's all going to work, and then he's also in charge of how it's going to be fleshed out in each little place, like this, right here, into the local context. Colossians 1.18 says Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. He's the head of the church. And so here in our local context here, because this is where we need to focus right now, we need to get community right here at this church before we can show anyone else what true community is under the Lordship of Christ, led by the Spirit of God to anybody else. So Revolution Church is where we are right now. And so we want to see, okay, how is it that we're put together? How is this thing supposed to work? Because I don't know about you, I, I'm new. I'm new to this. I didn't really, I wasn't sitting under Billy Graham or I wasn't sitting under these amazing theologians and great success stories in church saying, this is exactly how you do this. And if you do this, you will have an awesome, perfect church. See, this, there is no school like that. Okay, this is the only school, and right here is the school. This is where you're learning. No, I, I graduated seminary. I still didn't know what I was doing. Okay? Okay, so how do we do this thing? So let's go back to the book of Ephesians. Let's just see how God wants us to, to, to organize the church, how to have community, proper Christian community within the church right here. Okay, if you go to Ephesians 4.16, this is what it says. He's drawn all the people together, right? It says that he drew them all together because of his death on the cross. We're all open and available to this. We're all sinners, so he brought us all in no matter what, uh, no matter where you live, no matter what you've done, no matter what you look like, no matter what tradition, no matter what background. And he says here in verse 16 that he makes the whole body, see again, it's him. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So when we read this, you get the sense that every, every one of you has been placed intentionally into this body right here. This is like no mistake. Like, he, if you're sitting here at Revolution Church tonight, you're supposed to be here. You're part, he drew you in to his body, his community, right? He placed you here according to his good pleasure. He knows your gifts. 1 Corinthians 12 says that there's, there's one Lord that gives us all a gift, and there's different types of service, but we're serving one Lord. And he puts us all together with the variety of gifts we have. So that the whole church, if we do our work, if we don't neglect our gift, but we, when we exercise our gift, you'll see a church that is healthy, growing, and full of love. Under 
one Lord. So we're intentionally placed, we're gifted, we're tasked, and we're needed. Everyone. That's Christian community, okay? That's not just doing a check-in. Do you understand? And, and see, here's what's happened in our culture that's so quick. A check-in is community, and it's not. I'm not saying don't check in, okay? But the problem is most people check in, and then they check out. And they never really got involved in the community that, was, that Christ died to draw you into. Now, this opens up a can of worms. This is, this right now, the next verse I'm going to share with you is highly contested because it goes against the grain. It goes against this, 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 this sin nature inside of us that fights against God at every opportunity. We are lazy, broken people. All of us, all of us, okay, and you hear it all the time. Listen, you ready? I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. Now, you hear that, right? You may have even said that before. Now, I'm going to stand my ground and say that that is wrong. Okay? You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But unless you're paralyzed at home in bed, Christians go to church. Okay? Now, if, if thou shalt not lie and thou shalt not kill, if, that, if you're okay with that, then you've got to be okay with all of it. Right? Now, let me share with you what this says here. We, we learned a moment, let's backtrack a little, that Jesus Christ died on the cross so that all sinners could be drawn into this community, right? And he placed us into these communities at his good pleasure, according to the way he wanted it. And he gifted you. Now, what good is your gift if you don't use it? Now, here's what it says. I'll go to Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25. Okay? Hebrews 10. I don't know if I have it up on the board or not. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Hebrews uh, 10, 24 and 25, it says this. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, some translations say good deeds, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So let's just kind of unpack this a little bit. What, what do we do? We're, we're supposed to meet together, right? He, he died on the cross. He drew you into the family. He placed you into a community, into a family. And then what he's saying is, don't neglect coming and meeting together. Because when you meet together, that is when you share your gifting so that the church becomes healthy, growing, and full of love. How does that happen? It says here, while we're together, we should be motivating each other. To, to acts of love and good works. We should meet together so that we can encourage some people. I mean, we're all in this together. And so when we come together, we shouldn't just leech off the church. We shouldn't just consume off the church, but we should come together and do our part in encouraging others to grow in their faith, to grow in their love, to grow in their service, to grow, here's a big one, in their perseverance. You know what I'm saying? Like someone's weak and, and tired, they feel defeated. So what do you do? You get around and you pray with them. And they just go, hey man, I feel better. That's what happens. Like if you're sitting at home, you can't pray for them by hand. You can't hold their hand and look in their eye and say, I care about you. Sitting at home. Like you can flow one off into the heavenlies. And I know that he's listening, but that person doesn't know you just prayed for them. They're not encouraged by what you've just done because they don't even know you did it. We have to come together. And, and maybe I'm just on a rant, and I hate empty seats, but listen, you are part of a community that Christ died for, and he placed you into this body, not so you could be elsewhere, but you could be here, not thinking of yourself as most important, what you want to do, but everyone else is more important than yourself, and come and pray and encourage those that are part of your community. That's what a Christian does. He does not sit at home. She does not sit at home. She comes to church and encourages the people that are there. That's what Christians do. Someone please say amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. The, the Bible is filled with stuff like this, Galatians 6, 2, to share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. 
We're all trying to obey the law. We're all trying to do what Jesus wants us to do, right? We all want to do that, but let's melt it down. Let's not be sticklers for the details, legalistic freaks who try to do this and try to do that and walk in the next because they don't want Jesus mad at them. Here's the real simple thing. If you want to obey all that this book says, let's just do this. Share each other's burdens. And share each other's burdens doesn't mean you've got to pay their mortgage. It might. It might be that. But you know what? If someone is struggling, you know how you share their burden? You tell them you love them. You pray with them. You sit with them. You just have a coffee with them. You go out to dinner with them afterwards. You, you just tell them that you care. It's anything. We're here to encourage one another. That's why you're here. Don't come here. Please. Don't come here to get. I beg you. Come here to give. Come here to give. Don't come here so that you can come listen to some freak who's up studying all night to, to, to yell stuff at you because you won't. Go home and study all night yourself. And then come and ignore me and go help somebody. <laughs> Look, we have, we have other rooms. This, we're gonna, we have other rooms. And if, if someone's hurt, you just leave on out of here. You don't listen to what I say. you got a Bible, don't you? Who doesn't have a Bible here? Yeah, we all have Bibles. You go home and study like crazy. He can feed you, feed you, feed you. And then you come with all that he's given, all that he's given, and he blessed you, and then go help somebody. That's what we're supposed to do when we come to church. We're supposed to share each other's burdens. Now, so can, can you see? Can you see all this Jesus just pulling people in? Just pulling people in from all walks of life? It's all based on the gospel. It's not based on a baseball team. It's not based on, on Yorkies. It's not based on the Seattle Seahawks. It's not based on anything that means nothing. It's Jesus Christ based on the gospel of incredible, crazy love that draws us all in to this community together. So let's just see the greatest display of community that I can share with you. And I, I've read this to you guys so many times, and you might think, man, this is so boring. He just reading the same thing over. I love that. This story is so good. It's like, what's your favorite food, right? You just got this favorite food you just love. You eat it every day, right? It's the picture on the wall. There's, there's perfection here. Like, where do you get where do you get the perfect pizza? Come on. You'll travel far and wide to get that stinking pizza, won't you? Perfection. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you a Christian community that is perfect. You ready? Perfect. This is what we're to shoot for. So if you're wondering why you're here, here's the goal. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. Jesus Christ has done this crazy thing on the cross. He gets killed and he goes to the grave and he he, he rises from the dead on his own strength. Like, there's no magician, no David Blaine out there saying, come forth. This is a dead guy who brings himself up to life. And so all of his followers out there, they see this. Like, they've seen some crazy stuff, right? Crazy stuff. But all of a sudden, here's the dead guy walking and talking, and they are freaked out. And so the church begins, he draws these people together. And the church begins, and, it's, and, it's, and, and you can see them all meeting together. And in Acts chapter 2, is this perfect picture of Christian community. This is what we're shooting for. 42. All, say all. all. You got that, right? That's a big one. All the believers. All the believers. Okay, that doesn't, that goes back to Hebrews chapter 10. This doesn't mean, well, all the believers that are here right now, because the other ones are fill in the blank. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That means that they were devoted to learning it. Like, it was important to them, right? That was, a, that was something they were committed to, to learning God's word. Not only, not only is it committed to learning it and, and having
having someone preach it and teach it and study it and meditating on it. But it also meant, devotion can also mean what? Like increasing devotion, increasing desire to want to actually do what it says, right? So in both, in both sense, they were devoted to this thing. They, were de they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. We talked about that, right? We don't need to go back. It's, it's joining together. Like they realized that they had been brought together into community, and they're like, yeah, we're doing this thing together. We're part of something awesome, and I'm not going elsewhere. This is where it's at. This is where the action's at. This is where the party's at. I'm committed and devoted to the fellowship, and they were devoted to sharing in meals, including communion, the Lord's Supper, and they were devoted to prayer. Listen, we talked about prayer last week. How many people want to see a bunch of people here get saved like crazy? Thousands of people, right? I'm telling you right now, it will never happen until we're a church of prayer. Every church that has seen just a swell of crazy salvation is because people pray their guts out for months and years and decades. And some churches, while the dude like me is out here preaching, they're in the back room praying for me and for you to hear it. Do you know what I'm saying? Prayer, like, I don't understand all that stuff, but it works. The other day, this is crazy. Y'all know Angela and Bucky, right? Y'all know Bucky was in the hospital, right? He was in intensive care for days. He had, a, he had a hernia, and so they removed it, and then he had internal bleeding. So they kept him in the ICU, so we went and visited him and all that stuff. He seemed to be okay, but they had to keep him in blood transfusion after blood transfusion. And it wasn't working. And you gotta get that, I don't know how much, but you're a nurse, hemoglobin, yeah. You gotta get to a certain number of, you know, your blood got something to be working right. You know what I'm saying? I don't know how it works, but there's a number, right? And so they couldn't hit the number, couldn't hit the number. How much blood they gave her, they couldn't hit the number, right? So she posts on Facebook, hoping for a good number, we wanna go home. So I'm sitting there and I said, and I said, Mommy, come over here. She was walking by. I said, Mommy, come over here and make out with me. I did that. I said, come over and make out with me. So she drapes herself over the chair, and this is where we, we make out. <laughs> this has nothing to do with Angela Bucket. I just want to let you know we're making out. Okay, the next story. Hey, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're sitting there. We, we, we kiss a little bit, but then we pray. We got this new thing right now, right? We're going to pray. We're going to pray more. <laughs> Seriously, we're going to pray more, right? And so I said, let's pray. So we start praying. We pray for our kids. We this, 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 this. I prayed for Bucky. When she got up from the shower, I went on Facebook and said, pray. Two minutes later, she comes on the list Amen. Amen. I ain't nothing. I didn't know if I had anything to do with it, but maybe I did. So I said we should pray. Amen. Not when we get, we're getting stuff like this, right? Creed, you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm-hmm. We need to just pray. We need to be committed to prayer. Let's just read on here. This perfect picture. Here's our goal. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all, can you say it again? All. all. It's beautiful. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship. Look at it. He wasn't just adding to the seats. See, that's what people think. Then more people went to their church. No. What did he add to? Fellowship. The people that were actively involved, arm in arm, saying, let's do this thing. No, they were active participants. They weren't, just, they weren't just filling a seat with their butt. They were involved. They became devoted to prayer. They became devoted to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to sharing and generosity and eating and praying for each other. They devoted themselves to the church of Jesus Christ. That's what happened. 
Okay, so here, here's the thing. We're in, we are in Revolution Church. So the question is, is, does Revolution Church, does it line up with the biblical standard for church? Are we doing things right? I, I, we have to, it's good to evaluate this thing, right? Otherwise, it just turns into a social club. And I'm just being honest, there's been times in this church's history, and it's been a short history, only three years, but we've been a social club. We've been a social club, so we have to go back. The reason why I like going back to the section of Scripture so often is because it's the mirror we need to look in. Are we doing it the way God says we should be doing it? So we need to ask ourselves, do we meet together daily? Are we devoted to the apostles' teaching? Are we devoted to prayer? Are we devoted to breaking bread and communion and sharing all of our stuff? And are we devoted to being generous? That's the question that we have to ask. Otherwise, we're not a real church of Jesus Christ. We might be a really neat cult. We might be a really neat social club. But that doesn't mean we're a good church of Jesus Christ. See, this is a good church of Jesus Christ. So do we line up with that? You know that I, I stopped and I grabbed a pen and paper. And in this church right here, there's not a whole lot of people here. It's a, it's a nice little group. It's, it's actually bigger than the average church in America, but it's not a big group. Okay? In this church, for, forget youth. And the young adults that just meet whenever. They just do their own thing. They meet like once, twice a week. They meet at my house. They meet over there. They meet at the park. They meet one flight up. They just meet and they hang out and they, they study the Bible and they pray and then they just go do stuff. Like that's their thing. It's organic. It's real. I love it. Okay. Not even counting that, there are 17 gatherings in this church. 17 opportunities for you to attach and, and gather to be devoted to these things. Um, Sunday, let me just go down the list with you just so you understand. And why is there a bug in my coffee? That is so awful. Sunday mornings, we meet for worship, right? Sunday evening, we meet for roundtables so we can once again share scripture, pray for each other, pray for our church. Uh, Monday night, the last three Mondays of the month, Big Mike has a Bible study in here, okay? I want to be, I just want to be the honest guy. You guys have always let me do that. I know you can't live in church, but I'm just telling you this. The scriptures tell that they met, that all the believers, not just some, all the believers met all the time. Right? You, you, you read that. Like, I didn't make it up. You read it, right? Anyone else? Okay. This is what they did, and you see what God did. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you honestly. Big Mike has a Bible study here on, on Monday nights. No one comes. I know you're busy. I, I, I'm, not telling, I'm not guilting you. I'm just telling you. He has a Bible study that he prepares for, and no one comes. Okay? Just, I'm just throwing it out there, okay? But he's there. Then... One Monday night a month, we have our just because dinner, just for no reason other than to just get together and enjoy each other, the goodwill of everybody, and share food and have a great time. Then there's some men in the church also that go upstairs. They're the facilitators of our 33 series where, where men are being taught not to be boys, how to be good fathers and good husbands, right? Good Christians, good employees, good employers, right? To reject passivity, to lead courageously, to accept responsibility. And to invest eternally. These are the qualities that we're trying to build into the men here at the church. And so the guys who run this thing, they meet on Monday night upstairs and they go over the curriculum and they pray together and they organize how it's all going to work. So they're meeting together as well. Tuesday night, uh, Tuesday, um, my wife and Candy, they get together. I think it's on Tuesdays, right? They get, they get together and they're going through a, a great book. And they're deepening their relationship not only with each other, but with Jesus. That's what they're doing. They're, they're committed. They're devoted to the apostles' teacher, teaching and prayer and, and coming together to just do this thing. Right? That's what they do. Now, at the same time, that same day, my wife gets kicked out. And Amanda, who's upstairs with the kids right now, she comes to my house. And there's a bunch of uh, young ladies that come to our house. And they go, they're, I don't even know what they're doing, but they're doing some type of Bible study there. I don't even know what book they're using. But she's discipling these young ladies. So they gather in our house, and she's meeting with these young ladies. So she's, she's involved. Uh, while that's happening, starting this week, it's just been, I don't know, the last two, three weeks, it just can't seem to, you know, schedules are terrible. 
But starting this week, Lord willing, my wife's going to meet with two young ladies at this church, two, two young wives at this church, and they're going to go to Mimi's house, and she's going to go through this curriculum that our church now has called Foundation. And, it, and she's going to go through it with these young ladies so that their relationship with the Lord would deepen. Okay, so that's what she's doing. And then, of course, on Tuesday night, the men, it went from 25 to 35 men meet here for our 33 series. Now, on Wednesday, of course, the ladies' life group is meeting here. They're usually 9 to 10, 12 ladies that meet here on a Wednesday night. They're going through breaking free. Thursday, my wife again meets with Amber here at the church to go through some discipling. Uh, 6 o'clock on Thursday night, pause, er, Fred flicks on heels. Okay, here's another one. I shared with you a moment ago, no great swell of the Spirit ever happens without prayer. I don't even understand it. Every Thursday night at 6 o'clock, someone in your church, the Spirit pricked their heart to start a prayer group. And there's like two, three people here. And I'm telling you, if you raise your hand and you want to see people come to the Lord in great numbers, you've got to come. you got to come and be devoted to prayer. Like, I'm being harsh. You're like, if, I know there's people with their piercing eyes right now. If you knew my freaking schedule. <laughs> I'm telling you, you just got to find time. you got to find time somehow, some way. On Thursday night, I also meet with two, three dudes in my office doing some discipling there. We're going through that foundations curriculum. Thursday night, the band gets together and they practice their music and they worship together. And I, whether it's Thursday or Saturday, they have a, they do like a, a either a Bible study. They're going through purpose driven life together. They study the words of the songs together, see the meaning of it. There was some spiritual gifting testing going on last week or the week before. They just, they're deepening their relationship with the Lord and with each other through the devotion to the prayer and devotion to the apostles' teaching. That's what they do, and I think there's some food. So they just get together and they do that. Friday night, I know Kelly and Wendy started opening up their house, so some people from the church are going to be meeting at their house. They're going to go through another great book, and they're just going to deepen their relationship with the Lord, deepen their relationship with each other. It just goes on and goes on. And then Saturday night, of course, the band gets here early. They do it again, and then we get together and we hang out and we do this and we learn from the Bible and we pray and we share the Lord's Supper every single week. That's what we do. That's what we do. Anyone gone to visit somebody in the hospital that was going to this church? You don't have to raise your hand. Anyone been visited when they were in the hospital by someone in this church? Anyone need any food? They got food. Anyone need any cash? They got cash. I got a car. I didn't want to take it, but I don't want to block that blessing. Kyle and, Kay and Kayla, they gave me their car. That's Christian community. That's insanity. Amen. But it's awesome. I just wish they had given it to anyone else but me. Because I'm stupid and prideful. But it's awesome, isn't it? They gave me a car. It's just it's crazy. Anyone ever need a ride? Anyone ever need a babysitter? Anyone ever... Uh, have baby dinners taken to their house? Anyone ever have a baby shower here at the church? Anyone ever just need someone to cry to? Anyone need someone to go shopping with, to go study with, to just hang out with? Anyone have a tree down in their yard and the church just round around the tree and around that person and took care of the tree? Anyone need to move and then the church round around that person and grabbed all their junk and moved it from one place to the other? That's Christian community. That's relational community. That's what we're talking about. It's not just coming to church and filling a seat. It's going to cut the tree down and move it. An active participant in the community that Christ died for and placed you in. That's what Christian community is. Hey, guy. What's up? Good to see you here. That's all good, man. So here we are, Revolution Church. And we're fit together perfectly. Right? Fit together perfectly. The educated not educated. Some of us are pretty comfortable. Some of us flat broke. Yeah. Some are from the north. Some are from the south. Some are young. Some are old. Some of us grew up in church. And they were just perfect. They grew up right in front of the flannel board. Woo. They love Jesus from the time they had their first pinky. Right? And we all want that for our kids, right? We don't want to go through anything. Don't drink. Don't smoke. How do you do? Don't drink. Don't smoke. Okay. But... That's not the case, right? Some of us may have grown up that way, but most of us didn't. Most of us haven't known Jesus their whole life. Some of us just got saved. Some of us have never cussed, never
sex, never had a cigarette, never did drugs, never had a drink in their life, and some of us may have done heavy drugs this week and just put it down. But Jesus Christ called you out of the darkness and brought you into this church, into this body of believers, into this little community. Amen. And here we are, because of the gospel, living in and enjoying this beautiful Christian community. So we should rejoice in that. You see, what happens, the tendency is, when we're rejoicing in this, we're so focused on you that we forget it. So there's this non-stop battle within the church of how to go. Is it inward focus? Is it evangelistic? What are we supposed to do? And I'm just going to tell you this. It's inward focus with an outward motivation. That's what it really, that's the church. It's not either or, it's both. They're one. You're inwardly focused because you want to go out. Do you see what I'm saying? What happens is you have this beautiful family that Jesus brought together. And you're living it. And what we're supposed to do is, because it's so beautiful and we're enjoying it, we're supposed to offer this beauty to others that don't have it. If you enjoy your church, if you enjoy the friendships that are here and the, the fun, and, I mean, don't you think everybody else would too? So to go out with, with a specific evangelistic program, I ain't buying that. I don't like that. I wouldn't respond well to that. I mean, some might. But you know what they want? They want community. Everyone wants community. Everyone wants community. Let me read you something that I saw on PBS. I'm going to read this to you. I saw this online just the other day. I'm going to read this to you. It says this. You know PBS, Public Broadcasting on Sesame Street people? It says this. Belonging to a group or community gives us a sense of identity. It helps us understand who we are and feel part of something larger than ourselves. Researchers also find that people with strong social connections have less stress-related health problems, lower risk of mental illness, and faster recovery from trauma or illness. Friends and family can also encourage and support us in healthy lifestyle habits such as exercise and moderation. The positive effects of con from connecting with others are lasting. Scientists have observed what they call hedonic adaption, our tendency to quickly adapt to our changing circumstances. This is why people who win the lottery, for instance, usually find themselves at the same level of happiness they had before they won. Close relationships, however, are the exception. In contrast to material goods, we are more likely to continue to want our close relationships even after we attain them and to continue to derive positive emotions from them. Everyone wants community. We all want to feel loved and part of something. That's why there is such a thing as the bandwagon. Because we all want to be part of something that's great. And Jesus Christ, he created something great, and you're sitting in it right now. In the church, with all of its black and blues and bumps and bruises and its failures and how it's hurt everybody, I know because it's filled with us. We're sinners. But it's the most beautiful place in all of the earth. It's a place that Jesus is king. And when his perfect love pierces your heart, you can express that love to other people. They will see the creator of the universe through this right here. It's the most beautiful garden. In, and this is the garden of Eden here on earth right here in the church. So we're the most effective, though. We're the most effective at reaching outward when how many of the believers are actively involved? All of them. All of them. If every single person is actively involved in building the church, that's when Jesus Christ, when he says in Matthew 16 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, that's how he's going to build it. So we can't do it our own way, think about creative programs and such, cool paint, cool places, cool environments, great music. It's not just about that. Jesus Christ builds a church when we do as Jesus Christ says, when we're all actively involved, using our gifts to reach out to the world and love one another, then he can build. 
everyone can, can, can be involved in the church. Now it says here that when, when, when everybody is active and they're all doing their part, it says that it's healthy, growing, and full of love, right? And, and here again, this supports the idea that it's inward and outward. Okay, it's healthy. How? It's full of love. Big hug, big hug, right? And growing. You see how it's both? It's both. It's full of love, and that love is just bursting out of the church. And so therefore, what happens? It grows. That's what a healthy church does. It loves on each other like crazy. It shares each other's burdens, and then it grows. You can't stop it from growing. Okay? Now, how can we all be actively involved? Here's where I have to repent. This is where I have to repent. Okay? This is where I have messed up. If we're all to be active participants, and I, and I, like I know all of you pretty much, and I know you so badly you want to see people come to Christ, and I know you love your church, and I know you want to see God use this as the catalyst to really rock the world. I know it. Like there are people in these seats right now, you crazy freaks, that literally think that we could reach the nations from this little church. I know that you're out there because I've talked to you. I'm not the only freak in this house. Okay? But here's the thing. The only way that happens is if we do it his way, not my stupid way. So I'm going to do something. I'm going to offer some things to you. We, we are most effective when, when it says that everyone does their own special work. And if everyone does their own special work, it's healthy, filled with love, and growing. Right? That's what we want. We want a church where we love like crazy. We love each other. We share each other's burdens. We help. And then it grows. Right? So here's what we need. I'm going to offer some things to you. I'm going to tell you some things that each week that I'm doing that is stupid for me to do. It's stupid for me to do. Okay? I shouldn't be doing it. And I'm going to offer them to you, and I want you to consider what you've heard here tonight, what the scriptures say about all of us doing our own special work. And I want you, I, I'm, I'm asking you to, to raise your hand to something and be involved in your church. I'm going to throw some things out that I'm doing every week, I'm wasting time doing it because there's other things that I could be doing. Okay, there's other things that I could be doing. And, and here's the thing. Uh, not only does it say that he that they met together every single day and they shared all this stuff, but in the next, uh, in, in Acts chapter 6, the, the, the apostles, the guys who are supposed to be praying and teaching, okay, I'm not an apostle, okay, but I'm a teacher, it says that they appointed people to do these things. Because they were doing it, and instead of studying the Word of God and praying for people and ministering in that way, they were handing out food. Okay? So let me share with you some of the things that I do that I spend hours on every week so that you can, we can have church. Okay? And this, is not, this is not Praise Moses night at all. Okay? It's not about that. But I was thinking about it. I on my motorcycle back home the other day, and I started thinking about this because I was like feeling stressed, and I couldn't like... I couldn't keep up with some stuff. Like, and I started thinking about it. Every time we take communion, when you put those cups to your mouth, guess who ordered them? The cracker, guess who got them? And every time you, 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 you wipe your butt, guess who got the toilet paper? And every time you blow your nose, guess who got the, you know what I'm saying? It's like every single thing. I started thinking, no wonder why I'm freaking stressed all the time. And I have all these beautiful people out here that keep saying, I want to help them. I want to help them. I'm so stupid, I don't even see it. So finally, the Holy Spirit, just boom, wake up, kid. Okay, here it is, you ready? We need a gathering game. The gathering gang is the, is the two, three, four people that come early. I know it's crazy. They come early and they stay late, which is what I'm doing now. And this is what the gathering gang needs to do. They need to take the three traffic cones by that door. I'm going to get detailed. I hope you don't mind. They're going to take the three traffic cones that are by this door, and they're going to put them on that road so we don't block the street and kill our neighborhood and make people mad. Okay, they're going to do that. They're going to make sure that the Bibles that are on the seats are the ones that match the numbers. See, there's certain Bibles here that are not all the same. And I'll get with you and I'll tell you which one. So that you can, so we can properly minister to the people that walk in who might not have a Bible. You know what I'm saying? So it's important. We want to make sure that they're evenly distributed. We want to make sure that the chairs are neat, that the place is presentable. We want to make sure that the coffee is made, the creepers are out, the bathrooms are clean, the bathrooms are stocked. And then after the service, instead of leaving to go do it and say, hey, you know what? The pastor will do it. Take out the garbage. <laughs> Take out the garbage. You know, I mean, they, everyone thinks that that's not important, but let me tell you something. When they come into a church, people come into a church, they're checking it out. Okay, they're gonna, a couple things are going to happen. They're going to listen, obviously, to the dude talking. Does it make any sense? Can I connect with them? That's important. 
But they walk into a bathroom and there's poop all over the seat and the garbage is overflowing, they ain't never coming back. I mean, I'm just being graphic, but it's true, right? So it's just as important as what I'm doing. It's just as important, and don't make no mistake about it, it's just as important. It's just as important. So we need a gathering game. Now I'm gonna say some things, and before you leave, if you wanna do this, I want you to tell me. Like I told you, you're gonna forget announcements, you're gonna forget this one too, and I'm begging you not to. Because, and it's not to take the load off me, because I'm gonna keep doing it if you don't do it, but I wanna be, I wanna be in the best position for God to utilize this church as a catalyst to rock this golden triangle and beyond. And, and it only works if we all do our own special work, right? So no one's out the hook. Here's the next, I need a supply guy. Every single week, I walk this place and I look for toilet paper, um, I look for hand soap, I look for paper in the copiers, I look for air fresheners, um, I look for communion cups, oyster crackers, uh, creamers, sugars, uh, paper in the photocopy machine, whatever it is, and, and I go and I get earplugs and all this stuff. And I go to the dollar store and I buy all this stuff. And I bring it back here and then we stock it. Okay, I need somebody who's going to say, Moses, once a week, I'll walk this joint. I'll find out what needs to be done. I'll take the card from you and I'll go buy it and I'll go stock it. I need somebody to do that. I need a cleaning crew. I need somebody or, or, or a couple or whoever that's going to come in committed so that it's nice and neat and orderly when, when visitors come in. Like, who wants to come into a dump? You don't want to, right? So when they come into God's house, and we're trying to represent Christ the best that we can, in some orderly fashion, the place is swept, it's vacuumed, the bathrooms are cleaned, the bathrooms are stocked. How many ladies love going to the ladies' room with no toilet paper? Right? And then it's like so mortifying because I'll be sitting there and have to come up to me. And everyone knows what they're saying because I immediately get out and go in the ladies' room. And they're like, oh, she just pooped. Ha ha ha! Right? You know, tell the truth, right? It's true. We need to make sure that that stuff is done. We need a creative crew. Anyone, anyone take the kids upstairs tonight? Anyone? Okay, at least you did. If you're a parent, I want you to walk upstairs before you leave. Okay, what's going on? The reason I want you to do that is I want you to see that, again, and I love being creative, but I'm blocking your blessing. How many people in here, you don't have to raise your hand, feel like you're kind of a creative person? Let's be creative, right? So every eight weeks, our curriculum changes for the kids, and we want to change the environment up there. So this week, my wife and I, we went up there, and we went with Kelly, and we decorated upstairs. So we got this new, this new series star called Blast Off. So we got like, we made these styrofoam planets with rings around it and rockets, and we hung fishing string, and they're all hanging from the ceiling. It looks cool for the kids, right? So it's an awesome experience for the children, a great environment where they can learn, right? Get involved with that. If you would like to help, let Meredith know. Go to her and say, you know what, when, you, when you're a week or two out, I'll go with you to buy the supply. Every week, every, every series, we have to print up this list of supplies, and her and I go to the store and we spend hours, like we spend a whole day buying all this stuff, candy and supplies. Then she comes back and by herself, and for eight weeks, she puts every single supply, she reads through all the curriculum. She finds out what each week needs for the teacher, and she fills the supply bag with all that they need. We run off the curriculum, we print up the curriculum, and then we give it to the teachers, and we make out a schedule. Like, we love you, we want to do it, and we want to care for the children that God gave us to take care of, but look at you. You could do it. You're creative. You're well able. You could do this stuff. So if you'll help her, we already have a great group of teachers. I love you girls. You're awesome, right? Awesome. But we need help in the other areas. So if you would help her in, in creating and being a creative group for the for Evolution Kids, please see Meredith before you leave. We also need a video guy, Tim Murata. And so we need someone who's going to capture video, we need someone who's going to convert it, Tim, and we need someone who's going to upload it onto YouTube, Tim, every single week in a timely and professional and detailed manner so that people will be able to catch the message and maybe find some hope. Do you guys know anybody who's qualified to do that?
we want variety. The, the body of believers is a mosaic of different people. They express themselves a different way. And if you want to be part of a drama team, see Jessica before you leave. She'd like to connect you with that. Okay? Now look, these things that I mentioned to you, these are just things I know that need to get done so we're in a better position so that God can use this church as a catalyst to bring more people to himself. And if we're all actively participating in this, it will work better than it has to this point. Okay? But these things I mentioned, they're just the beginning. If the Spirit of God is working on you in something, and you feel like this is something you should do, I want to hear, come see me. Come see Dan. Come see Kyle. See us. Let us throw resources at it if, we're if it's available. We want to support you in that. Let's pray through it. If it's not complete heresy, let's do it. You know what I'm saying? You have ideas. I'm giving you the lame ideas, like picking up trash and taking out cones, because that needs to be done. That's not really going to get it done. But if you've got some ideas, like the backpacks and the drama and the kids going out collecting food, it had nothing to do with me. Nothing to do with me. Those are the best ones. So if you've got something that God's working on, let's do it. Okay? Let's do it. An inward focus with an outward motivation. That's the community that you're sitting in. That's the church that we're supposed to be. Okay? So now I'm going to ask that the gentleman would come forward. We're going to take communion together. We take communion together. Okay? And I want you to be thinking about these things. I just threw out to you these different things that this church needs to be better at so that God can use it for his glory. Okay? I want to offer these things to you. And if you feel like God, you can do this, that God has gifted you in that area, if he's given you this, the, the spiritual gift of putting out cones, I want to know about it. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't have to be too fancy. It doesn't have to be too fancy. Um, Kelly, you're going to come lead us in communion.